There's been a lot of buildup around this Bitcoin ETF, so I want to get right into that. The SEC is due to give you a decision on your application at ARC for a Bitcoin ETF on January 10th. Um, and like I said, it seems like it's been a lot of back and forth between potential issuers and the SEC, but that it's been productive, I think, is the vibe that I'm getting. So to the extent that you're able to say, how would you summarize sort of the current state of progress on the Bitcoin ETF front? Yeah, well, after being denied a few times without any questioning to uh, be questioned back and forth this time around has been very encouraging. Uh, and also shows the depth of the SEC's knowledge of the issues and understanding of them. So um, we're quite gratified and, uh, you know, hoping, hoping. <laughs> I believe the SEC set a deadline for final updates to filings of this Friday. Um, so I, I heard encouraged. Are you optimistic about, you know, the shape your application is in and that it could get greenlit by January 10th? Yes, we're very encouraged with our, our partner, uh, 21 Shares. I think we've crossed every T, dotted every I. Uh, I we believe to the SEC's uh, satisfaction. I think the messaging around uh, the 29th is, look, if you're not going to be ready to go on or around, let's say, January 10th, then do not submit anything more to us because we have too much to do here. Uh, and again, that also is encouraging because uh, it feels like a bit of uh, that the SEC is setting a deadline for itself. So that's great. Understanding the confidential nature of these talks, can you tell us a little bit about what some of the feedback has been like? Is it is it super, super technical? Is it around disclosures? I mean, these conversations that you've been having, what, and you've already said a little bit of this, but what does it say to you about the stance of the SEC, which, as we all know, historically has been um, not as engaging and, shall we say, collaborative on Bitcoin ETF efforts? Yeah, I guess the, the biggest controversy, and this is in the press, uh, but I'll highlight it because I think for most of it, most of us, it has been wow, are they going to allow in-kind uh, transactions? So, you know, limiting the tax uh, impact of transactions, or is it going to be primarily in cash? And uh, I think as has been reported widely, uh, I think it's cash, uh, not in-kind, at least at the outset here. Uh, and I think there are just a few people within the SEC who, um, are just somewhat concerned that banks will be forced to touch crypto. Um, uh, we're not sure they will be, but uh, uh, we're talking about something very technical. So uh, to answer your question, yes, very technical. Uh, but that that has been, I think, the big issue as we head, hopefully, towards a resolution. Well, the bull thesis around the Bitcoin ETF assumes that once an ETF or several of them get approved, that's going to help attract new capital into the market, particularly from institutions and, you know, those investors that have been really curious and, you know, have watched crypto, but have been sitting on the sidelines waiting for a product of this kind. A lot of people out there, however, um, you know, we're hearing are skeptical that the market reaction aren't going to match the current buildup that we've been watching, like we talked about with the just, you know, the engagement and the feedback. Um, especially as of late, as firms like yours continue to be in conversation with the SEC, and that what could happen instead is more of a relative value trade out of existing products like GBTC, which you're an investor in, um, and crypto futures ETFs into the spot ETFs. What do you think? Well, I do think there will be repositioning for all kinds of reasons, but uh, I do also believe that uh, the SEC approval will be a green light for institutions who have been holding back. Now, we've had an, a big anticipatory move here. It wouldn't be surprising if we saw a sell on the news. That's a, an expression in the market. Sell it. You have a lot of anticipation. A price moves up. Uh, the event happens. And then uh, especially fast trading organizations sell on the news. But 
Uh, beyond that, that I think will be just a, maybe a very short-term phenomenon. Uh, I think that the institutional push into Bitcoin will be quite significant to the price. In fact, uh, in our price expectations going forward, the biggest contributor is institutions as they move. You know, they don't have to move very much in. They can move. They, there are trillions of dollars in assets to be allocated. If they just move in 0.1%, forget about 1%, but even 0.1 or 0.2%, that will move the needle, especially as, uh, as we know, the number of Bitcoin outstanding right now uh, is about 19 and a half million. And the, the further that number, the furthest that number is going to go is 21 million. So the scarcity value as institutions move in, uh, will begin to move the price, we believe. Going back to Bitcoin investment products, it's been more than a month since ARK and 21 shares launched a suite of five actively managed Bitcoin and ETH futures ETFs. I think we spoke that day, actually. How has it been going? Is what's What is the demand like that you're seeing for these products? And um, if you could just go a little further on you know, what your expectations for their performance are should your spot Bitcoin ETF get approval? Yeah, um, well, as with any uh, new uh, ETF, there, it's, it takes a while to educate, uh, educate investors, asset allocators, advisors uh, about these new offerings. So slow as it goes, but the most important thing that's happening right now is you know, we're watching the plumbing and the plumbing works. That's that's extremely important. You know, 21 shares is the largest pure play ETP crypto provider in the world with roughly two billion dollars in assets. So th that has been mostly in Europe. This is in the U.S. now. And so we wanted to make sure the plumbing works and it's working beautifully. Uh, and I do think that uh, a spot Bitcoin ETF will stimulate once once institutions and other investors have a toehold into the space, they will want other way, they will want ways to diversify. And so we wanted to be ready with those five strategies to help with actively managed diversification strategies. Some are lower volatility, uh, some are more diversified with digital asset equities. Uh, so again, we're we're trying to be, um, uh, shall I say, a go-to for anyone thinking about investing in in digital assets. Recently, Needham published the results of a survey that they conducted. It showed that investors who haven't already bought Bitcoin aren't likely to start just because a Bitcoin ETF becomes available to them. And among existing Bitcoin holders, uh, it said 49% indicated they prefer to buy crypto on an exchange like Coinbase, while just 40% said that they prefer the ETF. So that's a modest difference. But if true, it sounds like that should bode well for something like Coinbase. Uh, do you see ARK's prospective ETF as a competitor to Coinbase, which you've also been a, a big investor in? Yeah, it's uh, the largest position in our flagship strategy. Uh, so we're very optimistic uh, about Coinbase. Now, if you, um, I'm going to go back to what I, I mentioned about institutions. Institutions don't want to bother with custodying and, and so forth. They want, and, and tax issues and, uh, and other infrastructure. They just want to be able to access uh, quickly uh, Bitcoin and, and other digital assets, we think, longer term. Uh, and and so, uh, you know, if if we're right, uh, a, a spot Bitcoin ETF will be the m most liquid way to access uh, to access exposure to, to Bitcoin. Uh, and, and I think that that liquidity and the ability to move in and out quickly is is going to be important to institutions because some institutions, yes, will be buy and hold. Others will use uh, use the ETF really as um, a way to play a new asset class. And, you know, they'll want exposure at times uh, because of the diversification. 
increases risk per unit of, uh, I mean, increases return per unit of risk. Uh, so uh, I think they, they can't ignore it. And so this is a very good way to access it. Looking at your activity at ARK Invest, you recently offloaded about $13 million worth of GBTC, so the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, um, and, and I think you've been offloading for several weeks now, uh, as well as $200 million worth of Coinbase shares. Tell me a little bit about the reasoning and the motive behind those trades. Sure. Well, as, um, and, and this is uh, portfolio management, essentially. So we've had... Um, both appreciate quite dramatically this year. This has been the best performing asset by far uh, this year. And we always do take profits. Uh, it's just simple portfolio management on top of uh, the actual price appreci appreciation of Bitcoin. We've had uh, the discount closing relative to NAV for GBTC. So that's been, you know, a double impact in terms of appreciation. So uh, it's uh, just uh, traditional portfolio management. So you said earlier that you see um, institutions as the biggest contributor to the price of Bitcoin. Um, I think you're talking over 2024, but what else is part of your outlook? Obviously, there's the halving and we're talking a little bit about rate cuts and, um, you know, regulation is still kind of an is kind of a dark cloud over the industry still. So, you know, beyond what happens with the ETF and the institutions that are expected to, you know, come into the market, what else is on your mind in terms of what's driving the direction of Bitcoin over the next year? Well, I think something happened uh, this year that uh, will continue to inform investor decisions. Bitcoin appreciated during the regional bank crisis. So as the KRE, the, the regional bank index imploded and Silicon Valley Bank went under, Bitcoin appreciated uh, in the middle of that crisis, roughly 50%. And so we have a new role for Bitcoin, and that is not only a risk on asset, but a risk off asset too. Think about that. And why is it? It is because Bitcoin, unlike our banking system, does not face counterparty risk. Uh, it is completely decentralized and transparent by, by wallet address, right? Uh, and so our on-chain analyst, David Buell, can watch the network all day long and see movement and spot unusual uh, activity. Um, and we certainly saw that last year as Celsius was going under and others. It was Bitcoin that didn't skip a beat. So I really think it's proved its metal. And that is informing institutions. You know, they may not have have liked it at one point in time, but that that uh, regional bank crisis um, spoke volumes. Uh, now, so we look at Bitcoin as a hedge also against both inflation and deflation. So think about that. We have a risk on asset and a risk off asset. It's a hedge against inflation, much like gold is, um, because its quantity is fixed out there. And then um, it's uh, a hedge against deflation because of this notion of counterparty risk, um, not subject to it. So it's going to play a lot of roles in a lot of portfolios. And, you know, our, our forecasts are over five years and over a five year investment time horizon. Uh, we do think that it will, uh, for some people, take the place of physical gold. So that's a big mover. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, institutions will start with 0 0.1, 0 0.2, maybe going to 5% if, uh, if our analysis is correct, that's what usually happens with a, a new asset class. And then we have the emerging markets. If you noticed El Salvador and now Argentina, both of the presidents of those countries are supporting Bitcoin. And why? Because they've watched themselves and the, their populations, their purchasing power and their wealth um, being destroyed by bad monetary and fiscal policies in those countries. And that's not just true of those two countries. It's true elsewhere in the world. So we would not be surprised 
to see Bitcoin become legal tender in many more emerging markets. That will be another very big use case. And then related to that somewhat is remittances. You know, it's it's easy to transmit uh, once once people understand, have wallets and understand how to do it. Um, uh, Bitcoin for little or no charge at all, whereas going through Western Union can cost 8%, 10%, 23% in Nigeria of even $100 as families in the U.S. try and transmit or remit uh, funds back to their families in emerging markets. So a strong setup for Bitcoin. I know you like Ether and Solana as well. What is, what's your outlook for those two coins? Well, we do think that uh, smart contracts are going to grow in importance as uh, decentralized finance um, de- continues to develop momentum. And both of those are smart contract networks. Each of them uh, has uh, benefits and some trade-offs. Uh, but we both, but we think both are winners. And to have watched Solana after last year's controversy with FTX being such a big supporter of Solana, and to watch the developers stick with uh, with with Solana is uh, speaks volumes to us. I always say, follow the developers, and they certainly stuck with Solana, and they are also scaling uh, in in terms of Ethereum as well. So we think those are two powerful networks in the decentralized finance space. And we also think that this notion of DeFi, decentralized finance, that, you know, if people just start looking at it and thinking about it as simply the the Internet financial system, uh, the Internet in the early days was never conceived of um, as uh, hosting commerce or financial services. And so developers back then didn't build in that capability. All that's happening now with Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum and Solana is developers are building in native currencies and, um, and much more streamlined, fewer intermediaries, streamlined uh, ways of uh, dealing in the financial system much more efficient, much more productive, just like the internet itself.